Hey, happy, happy Women's, Women's Day. Day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, everybody, welcome back. We are here for it's Astro Coffee time. And this is it must be the, the, the Thursday at three o'clock in the afternoon because we are here to discuss the latest in astronomy and astro astronomical research. And today we're going to be talking about the faintest galaxies in the universe. How do we find them? Where are they? What are they? Uh, and it turns out this problem is is being uh, is being simulated. It's being it's being observed in a, in a variety of different ways. And our guests today are going to help us understand how we are going to find these faint galaxies because the problem is, as we, as you can imagine, faint things in the universe are hard to see. But these guys seem to have a good solution worked out, and we're going to talk about that today as part of a latest a paper that has come out uh, with their work to help, help us isolate some of these faint galaxies. Now, these hangouts are a, uh, an, an, an endeavor to help connect you with the uh, latest astronomy research being done out there, and they're done in the spirit of, uh, of, of institutions and universities around the world. And I'm going to have Carol introduce that here in just a minute, but these, uh, we want to invite you in to the world of professional astronomy. Uh, and there's a, we, and this is your chance also to interact with a lot of our uh, with uh, with not a lot of our guests with all of our guests and the best way to do that is we have I'm, I'm streaming on multiple platforms um, the all in one chat that I love looking at is my Discord server the link to that is in the description box I'm looking at that uh, as well but I'm also looking at the live chats on all the various platforms what platforms well YouTube uh, is the big one we also are on Periscope right now I'm also uh, broadcasting on Twitch and uh, Facebook also on the Deep Astronomy page on Facebook. So I'm in all of those places, and I'll be periodically checking all of those out. Um, but let me go ahead and bring up my panel of guests. Uh, and let me start with my co-host, Dr. Carol Christian. She's in the bottom down there. Hi, Carol. Hello. How are you? Is it cold where you are right now? I'm hearing there's a big storm going on up in the Northeast. Not so much? Yes. It's cold. It is cold. It's actually yes. cold here in Florida, too. I'm wearing my long sleeve shirt. It is. Yeah, of course, heck? it was warm when I was gone. But, and then I got back and the temperature oh. plummeted, and here we are. Two yeah. storms in a row. Bang, it, bang. It does me that, too. If it follows you, follows you around, doesn't it? All it, does. it does. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so these, if you want much further in the hangout i like to say at the very top of it there's lots of ways that you can help support deep astronomy uh that we would really appreciate so as you're watching this hangout if you would hit the like button if you're liking what we're saying share this out to people that it's going on help get the word out about these hangouts because we want to grow our audience uh this year in a way that we've never we we we've we want to try and get a bigger uh audience and so we need your help and the best way to do that is to share things, to like them. Uh, definitely tweet at us. Follow us on Twitter at Deep Astronomy. Let us know what you think. And also let us know uh, what, what topics you'd like us to cover because Carol and I can look at those and try and, uh, and accommodate you because we want to be able to give you the kind of content that you want as well. And if you also uh, would like, and, and if you'd like to do some financial support, that's also appreciated. The best way to do that is through Patreon. We have a Patreon campaign, Deep Astronomy, or patreon.com slash deep astronomy. So please consider a dollar or so to help out uh, getting uh, these hangouts continuing because most of it is, uh, is, uh, is supported by w listeners and, um, and watchers. So anyway, I wanted to get that out of the way. We are also planning on a Patreon, or not a Patreon, a, a, a deep astronomy shop where you'll be able to buy T-shirts and all kinds of cool stuff. I've already got a test T-shirt designed and ready to go, and I'm going to do different other. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, of course. There's always a phone call when, whenever we touch out. <laughs> and okay. Carol's gonna get, and Carol's going to answer the phone right now, so she's going to she's going to be taking a phone call. Uh, but we also have we're going to be having some t-shirts available so look out for those as well. I'll post that in the description box of the videos as we get closer. Okay. So today uh, the topic is faint galaxies and my guests today are all from Yale University and they are in the top panel across uh, 
the uh, across the top here we have um, in the upper left uh, is Dr. Marla Giha. She's uh, she's uh, an astronomer at the at Yale University. Hi, Marla. Welcome. Hi. And right next to her in the panel together are Dr. Shani Daniele and Dr. Peter Mendoza. I'm not quite a doctor yet, but on my way. There. Oh, am I, am I jumping I'm the gun? Student. Oh, um, okay. I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Okay. So Shani, uh, Daniele and uh, Dr. Peter Van Dockham, also from Yale University. And you've been looking at these faint galaxies. Now, let me set the stage here just a little bit. And you can tell me if I'm getting this, the, getting this right or wrong. But the largest scale structures in the universe are essentially these giant dark matter objects. And they, they have object, they are astoundingly huge we're talking 10 to the 15 solar masses okay but embedded within this structure are smaller dark matter blobs that uh they're called halos in many cases and within those halos are some of the largest galaxies in the universe the elliptical galaxies for example like ic 1101 which you've seen me do a video on uh spiral galaxies all of those are inside these dark matter halos, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, but embedded down in those are even smaller dark matter halos on order of about 10 to the 12 solar masses. And um, even, in, in, again, going down, there's, you know, there's just dark matter halos embedded in dark matter halos embedded in dark matter halos. And within all of these halos are galaxies of different sizes and shapes. But the smallest galaxies, the dwarf galaxies, are also, they also have dark matter halos. I mean, you've heard us talk about it in, in these hangouts before, the Milky Way galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy, very large by, compar by comparison to a lot of other galaxies. And we have an orbit around us or attached to us gravitationally to dwarf galaxies, probably more, uh, that are, that are uh, in our area. These also have dark matter associated with them. And it turns out that this structure is basically... Dark is it? As I was reading this this press release and and the re, the summary of the research, it occurred to me that it's just instead of turtles all the way down, it's dark matter halos all the way down. When you talk when you when you talk about dark, you know the structure of the universe, uh, it keeps getting uh, uh, more and more dark matter embedded in there in various structures. Now, when you look at these smaller structures, and you compare them to how you see the largest structures in the universe, you, you really, it's really hard to know what you're looking at. And in, in some sense, it's not really, it's sort of a self, a self similar structure. And so today our, 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 the astronomers today have developed a way in which they can predict when you're looking at these far away structures, the smallest ones, how can, how many can you expect to find? How many dwarf galaxies, for example, could you expect to find in an area of the universe where the, the, and you're using a telescope of a certain um, dimension or a certain sensitivity and, and resolution? And so um, this problem, I guess you guys have been working and using the Dragonfly Telescope, is that right, in, in, among other things? Yes, that's right. That's our main uh, telescope we use for looking this, for these um, dwarf galaxies. And but observational data is pretty hard to come by, correct? I mean, you guys are are starting with these simulations. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the simulations that you're and the software that you're running to predict these? Yeah, sure. So um, as you said, uh, we really care about these, uh, you know, dark matter halos, and um, the way we're trying to trace them are basically by looking for the dwarf galaxies uh, that reside with these, within these halos. Um, and what we, uh, what we made in the paper is that we um, basically tried uh, to predict the number of these uh, this very uh, faint dwarf galaxies. Um, so we wrote a tool uh, called ArtPop that uh, basically simulates these galaxies, these, these low mass galaxies. Um, and uh, we actually, we didn't quite use this tool for, for our prediction, but just to demonstrate in the paper how a dwarf galaxies with just very few stars will kind of become more and more blobby rather than uh, resolved into individual stars as we go further away. Uh, so the way people have been um, detecting these dwarf galaxies uh, just next to us in the local group and a little bit beyond is just by basically basically counting stars of, of these galaxies since you could have been you could have detected these stars 
However, as you go further away, you can see that this uh, resolved galaxy is becoming more and more blobby. So you can see it in the bottom right. Um, so with our telescope, we are not uh, detecting individual stars, but we're just detecting this uh, diffuse extended light of the galaxy. Um, and assuming some uh, sensitivity of the telescope, so um, how, um, how um, what are the lowest levels you can uh, detect of this diffuse extended light, and what is your angular resolution? We calculated the number of dwarf galaxies we expect to see uh, out to some distance. So, okay, so you're saying that the, the you're, you when, as you look at these things that look like stars from the distant universe, you the more you go in, you're actually seeing a, a more of the of structure, a more blobbiness then. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So we see a more integrated light uh, object rather than a resolved um, galaxy. Okay. And uh, is there, well, first of all, I guess the first question I have is, is there a limit, I mean, to this? I mean, how far back have you been able to go i mean here you have in this panel we go anywhere from 500 kiloparsecs in the upper left all the way down to four megaparsecs in the lower right um, right so um uh, a very actually key point uh, in our paper that we uh, mentioned is that surface brightness rather than brightness is conserved with distance uh, when we look at the local volume or the local universe so for example in this example here uh, we'll be able to see this blob you see on the bottom right as long as um, it's uh, like the size is actually bigger than one pixel uh, of, of the telescope. So we can even see it further away uh, and we won't be able to see it or we'll see it as a point source once it's smaller than just like one, one pixel of the telescope roughly. Okay. And uh, so with the, with, with the, um... I mean, I think I think this also demonstrates another aspect of the same thing. Am I right? Yeah. So uh, what we show here, that's one of the key uh, results of the paper. And what we show here is the predicted number of this uh, dwarf galaxy given some. Uh, so on the y axis is basically the sensitivity I was talking about. So how faint can we uh, can we go with, with our telescope? And on, on the x axis, you see the special resolution. So roughly the size of, of one pixel. And what we show here is uh, basically the number of dwarf galaxies we predict to see um, between three and 10 megaparsecs. So this is uh, just outside our local group uh, and inside the local volume. And um, in the two panels, I basically show two assumptions uh, regarding the connection between the stellar mass of galaxies and the, the mass of the dark matter halos. And you can see that we get quite different results between the two panels, almost an order of magnitude difference. And uh, this was one of, the, uh, one of the reasons we actually were so excited about uh, finding more, more of these dwarf galaxies as if we'll have more of these dwarf galaxies and we can actually say some, something on their abundances or their numbers in, in some uh, large volume, we can actually try to constrain this connection between dark matter and, and stellar mass of galaxies better. The connection between dark matter and what, I'm sorry? Sorry, and this, the, the stellar mass of galaxies. And the stellar so mass the stellar of galaxies. component of galaxies. So you're trying to find a relationship between those two. So there is, there is a relationship uh, called the stellar mass halo mass uh, relation, which is well, well studied uh, in the last, okay. I would say, yeah, many years. Um, so we are trying, so this, this relation is actually very well constrained for high mass galaxies, uh, but for low mass galaxies, it, it's not very well constrained just because we don't know, we don't really know of uh, many low mass galaxies. So it's, it's hard. Uh, we don't have enough data. I get it. Okay. So this, this, and this helps you with that, understand hopefully a little bit. So let me go back to this a minute. On the bottom, he says spatial resolution in arc seconds. This would be the resolution of a telescope hypothetical or a real uh if you have a telescope that has this special resolution on the bottom on the x-axis mm -hmm. and you're trying to find things that are in that are very faint and that and the units on the on the y-axis are in magnitude per arc second squared or is that right. magnitude that's, that's arc basically seconds? the brightness per unit area it's brightness per unit brightness. area and for very as you get up higher on that scale, things get dimmer, don't they? Right. Okay, yes. good. I did, that's important because it's not a bigger number. That's a fainter number. Right. And so right. 
on the x-axis is how sensitive your telescope is, what it can resolve. The okay. y-axis is how dim the thing is you're trying to see. And these colors are how many per square degree of something you would see. Exactly. So that's okay. the number. And square. these little lines going through it are just uh, like, they're like contour lines in a pressure map, right? They just right. show uh, uh, the, 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 well, the average or whatever. It just, it's just a... Um, just the number you the get. Number, it's a contour line, right? It's the way I keep yeah. thinking of it. So, yeah. if you have a telescope that is four arc seconds resolution, and you're trying to see something that's twenty seven magnet uh, at, at twenty seven magnitude, is it magnitude arc second squared? Well, whatever. Yeah. You you would expect to see zero point four zero galaxies per square degree. That's right. Okay, so thank uh, you. If we, between three and ten megaparsec. Okay. From, yeah. And the difference so between the were, two. If you were looking, if you were looking at just a little bit of context, if the y-axis, if you were looking at individual stars, then that would be the brightness of the star, right? No, so, so no, so the on the y-axis we actually don't have. So when we talk about brightness of a star, we talk about brightness of a point source. But we actually talk about right. here is a brightness of some more extent. No, I, I, I know. But okay. if you were talking about point sources and people know what point sources look like in the sky, you would have a chart like this and say, how many, how many stars would you see with a, a, a certain telescope, right? How faint can I go? But because these objects are diffuse, then you have to do the, the magnitude per arc second squared because it's an area so it's like if you were talking about how faint can i go how faint can i go with a telescope it's kind of like that only because the object is spread over uh an area it, it's a slightly different yeah nomenclature nomenclature for so i'm just making a relation to amateur astronomers who think of how many stars can i see it's like that only these are diffuse objects Okay. Yeah, the, the challenge is the uh, to get that faint in the, for the fuse objects. Uh, that vertical axis is is really hard. Uh, but you can see that you really the numbers go up really rapidly when you go up on that on that vertical axis. You know, you go from twenty five to uh, twenty nine. You know, you have twenty times more galaxies. Uh, but to uh, to have a telescope that's capable of reaching those limits is is that is a big you know, a big challenge. That's really hard. Can you re remind us what the resolution of Dragonfly is? Um, yeah, that's 2.8. Ah, okay. It's 0.8 arc seconds? 2.8. I wish it was 0.8. 2.8. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't know why my but headphone... I think the point of the plot is mostly to show, or it, it also means that there are more low mass faint things than there are slightly higher mass bright things. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's what I wanted to get to next. So the real punchline here between the two panels, the one on the left and the one on the right, is you see more blue on the left, and that's the interesting stuff, right? That's how much better you do than you do on the right, correct? There's stuff yeah. There's stuff in the left panel that you don't see in the right panel. Yeah, although um, that, that depends. It's more like, um, you know, we'll, we'll count. Eventually, we'll know. You know, we'll know whether the answer is 0.2 per square degree down to those limits of, of say 29, um, or whether we see 0.05 uh, you know, or 0.04 down to those limits, and that will tell us which is correct. So it's more like these are predictions for different assumptions, and we'd like to know which assumption is actually right. So I, I, this says, well, if you do a survey and you find this many objects, then you know that your, you know, the correct function is is the one by Baruzzi or the one by Rodriguez Puebla. Okay. So it, it, it says more like it, it illustrates our ignorance, the difference between these two plots. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I don't want to spend too much more time on that, just because it was. Um, uh, why is my? <laughs> I like that image. There we go. Thank <laughs> you. I know. I, I can image. click on things all day long, and then things don't appear, and I'm like, hello, hello. 
Um, okay, so. <laughs> but this is this is a, the thing that astronomers do is we have theories and we try to understand the astrophysics through the universe. And then we say, okay, if it looks like this, then go out and find a telescope that's blah, blah, blah. Here's the prediction. And then you compare different models. And we certainly learn a lot from that. And usually the answer isn't either. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we have more questions. <laughs> Right. So here's a picture uh, that you guys gave me before um, we came, we started up. This is a dwarf galaxy. Why? What's so great about dwarf galaxies? Why do you care about those so much? Why not? Why not? Why not look at spiral galaxies or or other galaxies out there? Why do you care about these faint ones so much? Well, Marla. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the word dwarf galaxy covers a huge range of masses. So we use the. It's actually a terrible word. So uh, a dwarf galaxy, the most massive of which is like the Magellanic Clouds, which has a billion masses of the sun, down to some of my favorite galaxies, um, the ultra faints, which have 300 times the mass of the sun. And we call all of those dwarf galaxies. Uh, but understanding those, I mean, just the numbers, the ratio of the number of big dwarfs to the little dwarfs, uh, that's set by cosmology and that's also set by galaxy formation. And so. Dwarfs are, are great sort of places to study some of the underlying physics in the universe. They're also the smallest... dominated by dark, dark matter. And so we can learn a lot about dark matter as well. Okay. I want to get to that in a minute, but I just want to, did you just say the smallest dwarf galaxies were like 300 solar masses? Yep. Carol. So imagine Carol, just what's picking the 300 between, of those. What's the difference between that and a, and a globular cluster then? <laughs> Ask them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I so asked the, Carol's not a globular cluster. Yeah, that's a good question. The faintest galaxies, these things that have 300 times the mass of the sun, are fainter than the uh, a globular cluster, but their masses are much, much larger. And so Ooh. the answer, the difference is dark matter. These um, things that are very, very faint have a lot of dark matter, which globular clusters we think don't have that much, if any, dark matter. Yeah, we... Do do we know, are they necessarily, are the stars necessarily all the same age? Right. And we don't think that as well. We think uh, they, the ones that we've studied, they are all old, but they have very different chemistries. Whereas in a globular cluster, the chemistries of the stars tend to be pretty much the same. Yes. Because they're all the same age. The stars are the same age. They form together. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to dark matter. And um, the, that seems to be a, a topic whenever you talk about galaxies is it, that you, astronomers now almost never really seem to separate the two topics anymore. When you talk about galaxies, you anoint, you inevitably have to invoke something like a dark matter halo or a dark matter field associated with these galaxies. Um, how can a small dwarf galaxy of the sizes you've been talking about globular cluster size and smaller uh, get a dark matter halo when got when I don't think the clusters within galaxies have them. How how do these halos? Why are they just so intricately tied to a galaxy? It seems to me like in order in order to call something a galaxy versus just a clump of stars that are gravitationally bound in some way, you need this dark matter bit, don't you? Yeah, that's certainly the convention. Uh, I, I think when people think about galaxies, when astronomers think about galaxies, I think you're right. That's the dark matter is seen as sort of the defining characteristic of, of what a galaxy is. Um, and uh, the idea is that the dark matter is how it starts and then gas uh, falls into those uh, dark matter potentials. So you, at first in the early universe, you begin with, uh, with little dark matter blobs then due to gravity, um, gas falls into them, uh, cools, gets smaller, uh, it, and then ultimately it gets so dense that you start forming stars within those dark matter halos. So you think dark matter comes first, the galaxy comes later? That's the standard uh, view. Now, there could be circumstances in the universe where that, you know, that doesn't happen. For instance, the formation of a globular cluster, you know, a lot of mass uh, that turns into... Um, into stars without the aid of dark matter. Um, but that's actually somewhat of a puzzle. People don't really know how globular clusters uh, formed. And part of the reason is that uh, we know that dark matter is a super efficient engine for getting stuff to clump together and, and form stars. And, but apparently there's other engines too. But uh, certainly for these dwarf galaxies, um, 
the, the, the odd thing is there, there is all this dark matter, uh, but somehow the other part of the equation, the, the formation of the stars, uh, kind of spluttered and didn't really work. And this is something that Marla is an expert on, but um, for some reason, those things have very few stars and, and just tons and tons of dark matter. Right, we even had a hangout a while back on Dragonfly 44, which was a galaxy that was, was it 99, 98%? Yeah, 99.99. So here you just have a clump of dark matter bas yeah. basically making up a, uh, do you think that's going to be, now, now that now that I'm thinking about this, do you think that's going to eventually start far, star formation in, in Dragonfly 44? Uh, or is it like early like, on in the process? That galaxy is probably uh, dumb. Um, it's uh, it's it's already very old, so it has been. Now, how do you know that? How do you know that it's old? If you if if you're looking at a galaxy that's mostly dark matter, what are you actually seeing in it that's old? Well, there are stars. So uh, the, the two and, one percent uh, or so. You, you that's... can you can, uh, you can see what kind of stars there are, and in that particular galaxy, uh, there's only fairly low mass stars, so all the high mass stars are gone. And the interpretation is that the high mass stars, which have a shorter lifetime, um, all are gone because they, uh, they died. Uh, and then you can calculate, well, okay, given the number of stars that we have of this particular mass, um, how, how long has it been around so that all those higher mass stars have died? And so that gives you the age. But Peter, do you have gas measurements for that galaxy? Um, no, not yet. And uh, yeah, we, we were thinking of a, um, of a, uh, a VLA proposal, uh, maybe ask the director uh, to do that. Uh, because you're right, a, 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 a deep, um, you never know what reservoir there is, you know, whether it could start again. So it's, it's not been forming stars for a long time, uh, but it could always start again. Now it's also in the coma cluster and the coma cluster is a very unhappy place uh, for gas. Um, it gets stripped very easily and uh, so, the likelihood of find, finding a cold gas cloud associated with that galaxy is, is, is low, I would say, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't check. Just because it's got so many other stuff, there's so many other things in the cluster? Yeah, it's basically the, uh, the, the effect of uh, gravity on, on the gas as the galaxy moves through the cluster. It's also the effect of the hot X-rays bombarding uh, the cold gas and heating it up and, and, and stripping it. Um, so cold gas can only survive for a few orbits in a, in a cluster like the Palmer cluster. Okay, we've learned in previous hangouts of galaxy formation, as well as the one we did on Dragonfly 44 with you guys. Uh, with So we've learned that dwarf galaxies are very, very old. They've been around for a long time. But we also know that when we look at early galaxies in the universe from, say, Hubble and uh, other telescopes looking at the early universe, we see that the galaxies, even the more massive ones that aren't dwarfs, are weird they're misshapen they don't look like the galaxies that we see today they're less well they're less well defined um so how do dwarf galaxies first of all are they in the early universe and are you seeing them in your simulation not your simulation but in your in your observations are they in the early universe or do dwarf galaxies come along later because it takes a while for that stuff to get that old right and how would you know the difference? I mean, you look at the early universe, you're seeing all these misshapen blobs. They could be dwarf galaxies. They're probably not because they're not old. They're only a couple billion years old or something way back then. So how would you know the difference between, you know, well, my first question is, does the early universe have dwarf galaxies? And the second question is, how would you know <laughs> what you're looking at if, you're look if you can see one? So I would say we, the early universe, the dwarf galaxies were forming. Um, we certainly see dwarf galaxies in the current universe, universe that are forming stars. Most of the ones that are exclusively old tend to be in the Milky Way nearby. And that's why moving beyond the Milky Way and Shani's work is going to be awesome because we may find dwarfs that are sort of beyond the Milky Way that are forming stars. And that's actually quite an interesting question. And so that's why I'm excited to see some of those um, completeness plots and, and maybe we'll be able to ask whether there are these low, low mass galaxies farther away from the Milky Way where the environment of the Milky Way maybe doesn't suppress star formation that are both old, they have old stars and maybe they also have young stars as well and understanding those populations. Okay. And yeah, Marla, Marla is referring to a discovery that she made actually that, um, if you, if you 
uh, if you're a dwarf galaxy and you're not near a big galaxy like the Milky Way, but you're just out there hanging out there in space, you know, not interacting with anything else, uh, then it seems like you're always forming new stars. You're always adding to the stars that you already have, and, and there's cold gas that's turning into stars. Now, that's a remarkable finding and claim, and uh, she would actually predict, I think, that it, it, it should break down at very low masses, where you could have dead galaxies not forming stars in the field, but that's all um, entirely unknown. And so Shanice's uh, work will, that, will hopefully... That's remarkable. Be. So if you've got a dwarf galaxy just minding its own business, it's likely to have more star formation in it than if you than the ones say close to our galaxy. Well, what's our galaxy doing to the Magellanic clouds to keep star formation from happening? What's it doing? Robbing gas or what's being it doing? Being a bit of a jerk. You're being right. <laughs> yeah. What you know, what's the deal there? Why are we stealing? Re are we just? Is it because we're stealing resources from the galaxies? How? What do you think does it's that? It's literally so. If you look at the Magellanic clouds in gas, so if you're able to just see gas you can see a stream of gas being pulled out from the galaxy in both directions. And so it's literally being ripped apart and the material that it's using to form new stars is being ripped out. The Milky Way is ripping it out and presumably that gas will become part of the Milky Way. Okay. So it left to its own devices then that those things don't happen if it's out. How likely is that? How likely are dwarf galaxies out doing their own thing? Uh, I mean, there's a population of things doing their own thing. There's a population that are just reigning in. And presumably there's dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way that came in a long time ago um, and are now inert and not forming stars. Huh. Okay. Um, wow. So and is this research that you guys are doing with your simulations with this, are you getting more insight into this? Or are you just assuming this self-similar structure that we talked about at the top of the Hangout where – when you look at really, really large structures in the universe, they, they're, 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 it's sort of indistinguishable from the really small things. And so really the only limiting factor to you being able to find more dwarf galaxies is the resolution of your telescope. Are you, are, are you... Shani, actually, can I ask, so you're assuming the worst case scenario, right? That everything that you're looking for is dead that isn't forming stars. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's the one result. But in the paper, we actually also assumed... Um, yeah, younger stellar populations. And uh, assuming that, we actually got uh, a larger number uh, of predicted galaxies. Um, yeah, three, three times more uh, to be accurate. Okay, so the, uh, um, I want to talk, okay, so, so you are expecting then to just really only be limited by the telescope that you're using to be able to find, just keep going back and further and further back into the universe you'll still see finding these dwarf if it's galaxies. got stars we'll find it eventually okay yeah yeah, okay. yeah covering a, a large enough uh, area we do expect to see many of these uh, dwarf galaxies okay. but it is it is there's a there's a completely new aspect to all of this and actually marla is also involved in a, a different service strategy that that it does a that 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 also looks for these things but um if you talk about the Hubble Deep Field and other deep exposures, and in general about uh, the universe you know, beyond the local group, uh, we really only can see galaxies that are, that are much more massive than the things that we're looking at now. Uh, the things that that's, that's we hope to probe with, with Dragonfly and uh, in the future also with other surveys and with LSST are things that we so far really only have been able to study in the local group and, and very, very close to us. And just like other galaxies, more massive galaxies turn out to be very different than the Milky Way, you know, a lot of them, uh, we can expect complete surprises. You know, we, we just have no clue uh, what these uh, very low mass galaxies look like, how many there are, what they're doing. Um, and so we're sort of almost beginning anew with exploring from the Milky Way out, uh, just like people did, you know, 50 years ago. Um, but now at these extremely low masses, it's extremely faint things. Yeah, yeah. One one example to these surprises is actually the the a class of uh, new galaxies, uh, which are called the ultra diffuse galaxies. So Dragonfly forty four is is one uh, galaxy um, that we actually found uh, with Dragonfly. 
Okay. I want to take a quick break, and then I want to get to some um, questions and comments that I'm seeing uh, everybody do. I want to remind you that we are that you are watching the Astro Coffee Hangout from DeepAstronomy.Space. This is happening every Thursday, uh, except for the first and third, where we do <laughs> the future in space. But the uh, these where this is a hangout where we try and introduce you to the latest research in astronomy. And Carol has a few words to say about this as well. Uh, you're muted, I think, Carol. There you are. <laughs> American Astronomical Society is supporting the Hangouts as the American Astronautical Society. Um, our guests uh, are, you know, as many astronomers are affiliated with the American Astronomical Society, which is really our professional society. And we have meetings where we present our results, but also there are a number of services like there's something called, which I think I've talked about before, AAS Nova, which is a summary um, by graduate students who read the literature and then they do a little summary of the research papers that are coming out. And that's how I actually found these researchers and the faint galaxies um, study. So that's pretty interesting. And then there are other resources there. There are educational resources if you happen to be a teacher um, or there are outreach uh, resources if you just want to know about astronomy. So the Astronomical Society mostly is a collection of astronomers who are enthusiastic about their research, but they also like to talk about their research. And that's why they support the Hangout. That's Thanks. right. And so, and, and I want to also remind everybody to please interact with us because this is a time when I'm going to start reading uh, off all, a lot of your questions and comments. So you, some of you have already left some pretty good ones on the Discord server. Lady of Steel is commenting, I'm researching <laughs> to determine the dark matter content of lower mass elliptical galaxies in the southern sky with kids and gamma. I think it's G-A-M-A. And she says, OMG, this is the best way I could have spent my break between classes. <laughs> Thanks in advance for an already awesome talk. So thank you for commenting on that. I appreciate it. Do you guys, have you guys heard of that, kids, K-I-D-S and, and, and Gamma? Yep. Okay. Well, apparently she's... And feel free to have them watch the Hangout because it will be archived. Yeah. And uh, uh, the dark matter content of lower mass elliptical galaxies. So, you know, that's, a, it's a, that's an interesting point. I was reading um, the largest structures in the universe are apparently entirely dark matter. And it isn't until, you, and like I said at the top, it's like 10 to the 15 solar masses. Um, but then you get down and that's that's, you know you get down to elliptical galaxies, which are small in comparison to these structures. And these are the largest galaxies that we know of or that are in the universe um, as well. So these dark matter is annoyingly everywhere. And I say that because we don't really know what it is. It's this stuff that won't interact with us in any way, but we know it's there because it interacts with things we can see gravitationally. So we're, I guess whenever I hear you guys talk about dark matter and galaxies you all seem so comfortable with the concept you all seem honey like, are, are you upset that dark matter won't interact with us <laughs> i am i can't help but be a little bit upset because you know it's like you know it won't we can't see it taste it touch it feel it smell it anyway and all and yet we know it's there because we see it in this um effect that it has <coughs> excuse me that it has on things we can't see like the way galaxies rotate and a whole bunch of other things can you see dark matter, this is a personal question for me to you guys, in any other way other than the effect it has on galaxies, on large structures like galaxies? Can you see it any other way? Yes. Yes? <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of different, I think um, to me, other than uh, the motion of galaxies is by far the most compelling. Um, but there are other ways that if dark matter didn't exist, uh, we would know it. So I think the second most compelling issue is just the abundance of elements in the universe. So just the ratio of hydrogen to helium and to slightly higher um, lithium, that abundance, and we can measure that very well, would be very different in the absence of dark matter. And the amount of dark matter that you need to explain the amount of hydrogen and helium is almost exactly the same as how much you need to explain the motions of galaxies. So there's a lot of inferring going on, right? I mean, we can see, uh, we can we can kind of guess how much dark matter there should be on these different aspects of like abundances, like you said, and rotations of galaxies, and these amounts kind of match. So mm -hmm. that's that's sort of 
a um that's sort of a a, a, a pro for the the idea that the, the dark matter exists so, well there's a very visceral um evidence for dark matter is gravitational lensing mm -hmm. um particularly in in galaxy clusters where you can see you know lights being bent by the mass of the cluster and uh, and also of, of, of galaxies if you're lucky yeah and um and then you can calculate how much mass is required to to create that kind of bending um and again it is it's very difficult to come up with a model where um you you can explain you know th that missing mass which is has a very different effect than than the motions of galaxies you know here we're bending light um and the amount of mass that you get out of that is 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 basically identical within the uncertainties to the amount of mass that you need to explain the motions of galaxies yeah. So there was, it, it's not it, it's not just sort of a few things that seem to be connected to each other. It, the evidence for dark matter is, is is very strong. We don't know what it is, and and we also and this is maybe what you were alluding to earlier. We we don't we we know much less about how exactly it is distributed among the galaxies. So the um, the, the standard paradigm is that uh, the most massive things, galaxy clusters, are completely dominated by the stuff. Uh, galaxies like the Milky Way and uh, elliptical galaxies have, you know, relatively little of it. That means only about 30 times more dark matter than, than luminous matter, so still quite a lot. Um, and then uh, the faintest galaxies, again, are completely in dark matter dominated. But that whole story may be more complicated, because I think the more galaxies we find, particularly these low surface brightness galaxies um, that we're finding with Dragonfly and other telescopes, um, they, they, they suggest that there's actually more scatter, more variation in the amount of stars that you can have given an amount of dark matter. Um, so it's good always in these cases to separate the, um, you know, the headline thing, does dark matter exist, from, you know, do we actually know how it's distributed among the galaxies, you know, and exactly how much is there in a particular galaxy, those kinds of questions. And I think there, we know very little, and ho the hope is that by learning more about those things, we actually learn more about the nature of dark matter and, and get to understand, uh, you know, by how it behaves, uh, more about what it is. Okay, so yeah, I first heard about this, or I first learned about the gravitational lensing of dark matter and in clusters when we were when I was learning about the Frontier Field Survey that was done by the Hubble Space Telescope, and hmm. they were making they they had these models of lenses that they would apply and these were really complicated and I couldn't even begin to understand the models of the lenses but they took into account heavily this distribution of dark matter. Now when you say that we don't necessarily understand that distribution very well, how come I see these dark matter maps everywhere and I'm thinking specifically I was talking one of the earliest hangouts we ever did was with Dan Co at the institute and he had a dark matter map of a galaxy cluster and how was he able to make the maybe that's a little off topic, but do you know uh, how those dark matter maps are made? Is it done through gravitational lensing? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. It's okay. You look at the way that the background galaxies are distorted, um, and, and uh, you know, they, if you have just a circular distribution of dark matter, then all the galaxies in the background will be around, you know, aligned sort of around that distribution of dark matter. But if there's an extra clump in the dark matter, then you get an extra sort of distortion to the background galaxies that you can measure. Okay. And so what these, what these folks have done, and it is an incredible measurement, uh, is to, to map all these distortions of the background galaxies and then invert that to say, what is the mass distribution that gives me these distortions? Um, so that's, uh, now this is on vastly different scales than the things that Shani is looking for. Uh, as in, you know, 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses different with 10 to the 8. Um, so that's we, a, yeah, we that's quite different. make similar maps of nearby galaxies, but but uh, it, we can only do it really of galaxy clusters in that. that okay. Kind of All right. Well, I won't belabor that point very much, folks. But if you're like me and you're irritated about the fact that that dark matter won't interact with us in any way, you can't. <laughs> you just can't ignore the fact that it's there. It's probably there, uh, even though all these things, right? So that's why these hangouts exist. They're a support group. For people like us <laughs> who don't, who just can't deal with the fact that ninety-five percent of the universe, of think about it, ninety-five percent of the universe won't interact with us in any way at all. 
That includes dark energy, okay? But don't even go there, all right? So, yeah, I hear you. I feel it. I know it's annoying, dark matter. What are you, what are you talking about? I feel Wait a minute, our guests really like dark matter. I know they do, and they're great with it, and it, and it works. But at, Stop. But wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be great if you could grab some of this stuff and do something with it? But you you guys actually are. You're, you're, you're using, the, you know, the, the relationship... Um, you know, that, that Marla was able to find between the dark matter and, and, uh, the, the number of stars, all of these things that, that is huge. So I'm very pleased that you guys are out there doing this work. Um, although, although I should say, uh, I mean, from a personal perspective, if the dark matter particle is identified, it'll be a wonderful triumph of science. It'll also be a sad day. Um, because we, you know, this huge mystery is a, is a, is a big motivation for all of us. And, uh, it's just exciting to, to hunt down these galaxies, not know what to expect and, and, uh, you know, have this, this universe to explore. And the more we learn about it, you know, usually, which is really wonderful, the more we learn about it, the more new things we see that we want to explain. Um, but the discovery of the dark matter particle is one of those milestones that, that means that we, uh, we know a lot more, uh, but we have a little bit less mystery. Yeah, but you're also going to, if you win the Nobel Prize on it, you're going to be happy that it's there, that you found it too. So it Yeah, will. well, the person who actually identifies it will just be very happy. <laughs> yeah, they will, they'll be <laughs> very happy. That's right. They'll be like, woohoo, dark matter dance. Okay. Um, yeah, one person or one group will be ecstatic for sure. <laughs> okay, let me ask Achilles 308's question. He's got a good one here. Uh, can you resolve the motion in these newly found dwarf galaxies? And what do you hope to discover about their location and motion? So can you start with the first one? Can you resolve the motion of these dwarf galaxies? The motion themselves, not necessarily the motion within the stars of the stars. Within. Jamie, do you want to, you should answer that one. So uh, what we see with Dragonfly is actually just these blobs that we saw in the sim simulated uh, picture. And what we actually, so with Dragonfly, we only really detect um, these candidates. But uh, what we then uh, need to do is to follow up with more high resolution telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, um, to learn more about the stellar populations, for example. So to learn really about the stars uh, within these galaxies. And for example, one very relatively simple measurement, measurement we can do is to measure the distance to these stars and actually um, learn and understand whether it's uh, some sort of isolated galaxy or part of a group uh, of, of of a group of galaxies. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and what do yeah. you, okay, so what do you, uh, uh, okay, so what do you, and what about the second part? What do you hope to discover about the location of motion? The location? Mm -hmm. What I hope to, yeah, I don't know what I hope to discover. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I guess we'll find that many of them are isolated. Um, that's what at least my paper predicts. Uh, but, um, yeah, I guess we'll also find some that are, you know, members of other uh, galaxy groups uh, that basically, um, um, yeah, similar to the Milky Way satellites, uh, they just move around the center of the galaxy group, so the central galaxy. Um, yeah, I don't know what I hope to find. I guess I hope <laughs> to find. <laughs> well, I certainly, once you find a whole bunch, I will then go with another telescope and get spectroscopy. Um, to measure how fast stars within those objects are moving. Um, if we can do that, then we can measure their masses and really confirm whether or not that how much dark matter they do in fact have. And so I am looking forward to your discoveries so that we can then go back to the telescope and measure how, um, how fast the stars in those objects are moving. Yeah, that's right. One other, I guess, thing, um, one other thing I'm kind of excited about is to see how the environment actually uh, influences these galaxies and the number of galaxies and whether the different uh, stellar populations, the, the stellar populations is different between these isolated galaxies, field galaxies, and the ones that are part of groups. Uh, and, and indeed, like Peter reminded, uh, we were on this before, uh, Marla Pepper, whether we can actually find uh, isolated galaxies that, are, they don't, that don't have really active star formation. Okay, I was hoping to find out but that plot. I put that plot up there. Uh, I'm gonna put this one up. So we're talking about things the furthest away you're looking at in some of these is like four megaparsecs, right? So uh, we're hoping to get even further back. You, are you saying, Marla, that you can resolve the motions of the stars in these things that far away? Oh, yeah, that's easy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. 
Good. I'm glad. I'm well, glad you not to be dragonfly though, right? No, you need a different telescope and a different instrument. Okay. Um, but those should be easy to measure. Um, we get the spectra, so we look at the motion of uh, not maybe the individual stars, but the ensemble of stars, how fast things are moving. Uh, okay. All right. Kevin Lewis is asking, uh, hi, Kevin, by the way. Um, I wonder if dark matter is just the substrate of a higher dimension in our four that our four dimensions reside in. He may be trying to provoke me. I'm not sure. But um, this is speculation. So dark matter is a substrate for higher dimensions. Thoughts? Well, I think it's above my pay grade. Above yeah, your pay grade. Oh, that that's a cop out. That, that people are able to, uh, you know, come up with these thoughts, frankly. It's, uh, you know, this is a topic, dark matter, dark energy, that, that just causes people to, to stop and think. It's like, oh my God, we have no idea, you know, what this thing is. Maybe, maybe my idea is going to be the answer. <laughs> yeah. And the key is that if you can give us an observable, how, is there something that we can search for that's different um, for different kinds of dark matters? If it's higher dimensions, that's awesome, but give me something I can go to a telescope and test. Very good point. Yes, that's exactly. right. So Kevin, give us, give us an observable <laughs> and we'll, we'll let you know uh, on that. And, you know, with that in mind, I mean, I think the, the, the observer, they're trying to do that with dark energy that, dark, you know, they're looking at the rotate, not the rotation rate, but the expansion rates of all these different galaxies. And they're trying to find out with this parameter called Omega, which, you know, they're trying to get a better handle on some of the properties of dark energy that if it exists, there are observables that you can find. And they're looking at those as well. Um, 69 solo are dwarf galaxies older than the big, than the big ones. And do dwarf galaxies consist of a black hole in the center? Ooh, good questions. So are the dwarf galaxies older than the bigger ones like ellipticals? Cause they're pretty old. And do they have black holes in them? Peter, you get the first part. I'll take the second. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, they may, some of the dwarf galaxies seem to be extremely old, really early in the universe. Um, generically, you sort of expect uh, the big things to form first and small things to form later in the universe. Um, and that's the, the sort of the overall expectation that the big things were small ones, of course, but then they've taken a long time to grow. And by the time they get the size they are now, they've really, you know, grown for essentially the entire history of the universe. Um, but then again, those uh, people have measured the, uh, the ages of the stars in some of the lowest mass galaxies around the Milky Way. And uh, they are essentially as old as the oldest galaxies uh, that we see. Um, and of course, also the, uh, the, the global, oldest globular clusters around the Milky Way are um, sort of maximally old. Uh, you know, almost as old as the age of the universe. Um, so why that is, we don't quite know. Something caused these galaxies to, uh, to stop forming stars early on. So there are mechanisms in the universe that cause uh, galaxies to essentially fail. That's, they start forming stars and then stop. Um, and we may, that may have to do with supernova going off and then blowing out all the gas, maybe some other mechanism. Um, but uh, there's a large age range. Some of them are very old, some of them older than uh, elliptical galaxies probably, um, but um, most of them are probably young. Okay, what about the black hole question? Uh, the black hole question is great. So um, for the masses of the galaxies that we've been looking at, the images that Shani produced, um, if there were a black hole in those objects with the mass it should be, usually we see galaxies, the mass of the central black hole scales with the mass of the galaxy. So looking at the mass of the galaxy and looking at what we would expect for the black hole to be there, we wouldn't be able to see it. We won't have enough resolution. We can't, you know, we can't see those objects. And so there could be black holes in those objects, but we just don't know. If we go to slightly higher mass things, we have found black holes in sort of massive dwarf galaxies. Um, so we do think that there are black holes all the way down, but it's hard to tell at this point in these lower mass galaxies. You really kind of need them to be feeding on something, don't you? I exactly. Mean, and these things don't tend to be forming stars. So no, there's basically no food. Right. So if you don't, if a black hole's not eating, we don't see it just because, well, it's black. So uh, the way we see them is when material falls in, the, 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 the particles and the charged particles, the dust, gas, all of that stuff gets accelerated to where where it starts to radiate in different wavelengths, notably in gamma rays. They have these jets that come out, and, uh, and that's how we see them most of the time. So, um, so 
uh, yeah, otherwise, if they're not like the one in the black hole, the black hole at the center of our of our galaxy right now is not feeding, uh, which I think is a good thing um, because um, we'd be we might have gamma rays headed our direction. I don't even know what the well, maybe not. Maybe the gamma ray axis is perpendicular to the disk, which would be good. Um, Okay, Achilles 308. How do dwarf galaxies evolve? Do they get more compact or more diffuse over time? Do they tend to get dimmer or brighter over time? Do they hold their dark matter or lose it? So, general questions there. Um, uh, how do they evolve? You've already talked about that a little bit, Peter, when you said they, you know, they're old and, and lots of, of uh, uh, star formation has ceased in there. Um, do they get smaller, though, as they get older? So I think Shani trying to probe this idea of where they live is really important. So the history or the how they form is mostly determined by where they live. Are they in like a city versus the country versus a suburb? That will change the direction. And so when we're talking about clusters, that's kind of like the cities and you know uh, isolated is like living in the country. And it really depends on where you are will dictate what happens to you. Okay, um, I'm going to ask this question, but I'm not sure what it means. So maybe it, if if you don't either, then that's that's maybe I'm in good company. But Larry Keys is asking on on uh, uh, Discord: Is Dragonfly capable of determining the intergalactic medium? Ah, uh, well, do you know what that means? I do. Um, well, I, 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 there's an answer that pops in my head, but I don't know if if the if the person is actually referring to that. Um, so the intergalactic medium is, is extremely tenuous. It's extremely large. Uh, so it's this large, basically the large scale structure of the universe. Um, the stuff that's in between galaxies. Um, and, uh, that doesn't emit much light. Uh, there's, there's almost no stars in that, uh, in that regime. Um, but, um, there may be a way to detect it through, um, through line emission. So there's gas, very tenuous gas, uh, in those regions, and uh, just because the uh, there's uh, ultraviolet radiation everywhere in the universe, ultimately coming from star formation and from black holes, that ultraviolet radiation will once in a while ionize that hydrogen, and as it recombines, it'll emit light at particular wavelengths, and we're actually in the process of uh, of designing uh, a filter system to to detect that light with dragonfly. Um, and the goal there, uh, this is a, a graduate student, uh, Deborah Lockhurst uh, in Toronto, who's spearheading that. Um, the, the ultimate goal there is to detect the, uh, the cosmic web and the large scale structure of the universe. Now, it's a stretch goal, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we don't quite know how bright the uh, intergalactic medium today is. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we're, we're ambitious with this thing, so uh, we want to give it a shot. Yeah, that sounds So like the that. intergalactic medium could be hot. Well, that's the thing. Um, or so ionized, we, I guess, is a better, better than, right? I mean, in, in, is that the, what you're saying? It is. In, inside galaxy clusters, for instance, um, the temperature is so high uh, yeah. that it emits x-rays. And it's it's relatively straightforward to detect. But so what we're talking about here are the regions around clusters and even like the local group and in between, and yeah. Lower density regions where you expect a temperature more in the order of ten to the four or ten to the five Kelvin, um, where you would see the uh, H alpha emission, uh, which is what we'd be going after. Now people have been trying to do this in Lyman alpha at high redshifts, so much in an, in the ultraviolet where there's many more photons coming out, so it's easier to detect. But then again, it's earlier times in the history of the universe, so that makes it harder. Um, and uh, we, we would be trying it uh, today, the, the, the cosmic web today. Awesome. All right. Well, it is it for us today, folks. It's, it's 4 o'clock, so I better, better sign off. I want to thank my guest today, uh, Shani Daniele. From, uh, uh, she's worked on uh, from Yale University. Also, Dr. Peter Van Dockum and Dr. Marley Giha from uh, all of these guys are from Yale University who have been working on finding really faint galaxies and uh, have developed some pretty good techniques for, uh, for, for shedding light on what we might expect, when, what, what kind of telescopes and resolution uh, we would need to see if you for your telescope, what you would expect to see 
with it. Um, I meant to ask about JWST, but that that we don't <laughs> afraid about ran out of time. We'll see if you guys were going to be using that uh, to maybe find some of these early galaxies. But I'm sure you're going to be at least applying for time, right? So uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, I want to I want to thank you guys so much for taking time out to talk about your research with us. It's been really helpful, and I want to thank all of you for watching. And uh, I hope you'll join us next week where we got our first Future in Space Hangout for 2018. It's taken a while, but we're finally getting there. Uh, we're, working, we're finalizing the topic now, so I'll see you guys next week. Also next week is the uh, uh, ExoLife Hangout with the Planets Foundation. So we hope you guys can tune in. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, this was great. Thank out. you.